Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm really, really, really happy to be here. Uh, it's kind of a bit of a surreal experience. Uh, just to start, it's kind of surreal for me speaking after Brian. Uh, I think Brian's not here, so I can talk with him and not in the room. Brian's an amazing human being. Uh, and I think one story I'd like to share is that when I first started with Flutter, uh, I was extremely lucky to find Brian's resources, videos, articles. And more than that, he was just really helpful when I went to ask him questions. He kind of always made time for me and made me feel like you know, it was important to help me. Uh, and that really had a massive impact on how I relate to Flutter. I uh, so really thank him for that. And I just guess to, to kind of comment on what Philip talked about yesterday, it's this idea of paying a forward, right? Because he was so nice to me. When people come to me, I try to do the same. Uh, I'll share a very quick story with Invoice Ninja when we first released it. Uh, and I, sh I spent six months, nights, weekends coding it. I was so excited about it. And I sent it to the, the, the founders of, of Laravel, which is a framework we used. And the response I got was, uh, don't spam us. And I was just crushed. <laughs> I was like in tears almost, really painful. They didn't care. I mean, to them, I was just some guy emailing them, bothering them. I was like, listen, I spent six months. This is what I built with your technology. They just didn't care. And it had a lasting impact. I still probably hold on to it today, a bit sore about it. Uh, but it's a lesson learned, right? This idea that we have this amazing impact or uh, opportunity to affect future Flutter developers. So you guys are probably all experts or reasonably knowledgeable on Flutter. So as people ask you questions, hopefully don't tell, you, tell them you're, they're spamming you. Uh, really nice to be here. So what's this talk about? Uh, my name is Hilla Korn. I'm one of the co-founders of Invoice Ninja. Also, soon to be known as invoicing.co. Uh, I'll talk a little bit later about why we're changing the name now. Uh, just this talk is kind of half business story and half developer story. I try to combine the two and to share kind of lessons I've learned. And the first lesson I learned was be careful choosing your company name. Uh, I think looking back, <laughs> This was a mistake. Uh, my partner chose the name. It was a very good name, a very clever name. We had the domain. We had the dot .com, which is important. Uh, but it's silly, right? It's, n it's not serious, and it doesn't fit the domain. Invoicing is serious business, and it's really hurt us, I think, over the years. Uh, we went so far to buy a second domain, invoice.services, and we ran the app on two domains so that our pro users could have the option of having a better domain. And that was an even worse mistake, because uh, running an app on two servers, on two domains, is incredibly complicated with sessions and that kind of thing. Big mistakes. So we are, lessons learned, we are renaming our company uh, through a slow process. So you'll still see Invoice Ninja references, um, but hopefully in the future it'll be just invoicing.co. Uh, so just a little bit about us. We're an open source company. We have a reasonable user base at this point. Uh, one special aspect about our software is that we are completely open source. We don't have a community version. We are just open source code. We deployed a master from Git, right, to our production service from Git. Uh, and I think that's been critical and key to our success, and hopefully we'll keep growing. I uh, just want to highlight that I'm not, it's not me. I have two amazing partners, Shalom and Dave. Shalom is the CEO, Dave is the CTO, and I am the other guy. Uh, so I lead front-end development, but I also lead customer support. Uh, and this business story, I think, has been one of the keys to our success in building great software, is eliminating that disconnect or minimizing that disconnect and making sure that if developers are incented to fix bugs because they'll just keep getting annoyed with these emails about it, they're going to fix it and going to do a good job. And I think what happens, I've, I, part of this talk is I'm a bit biased against uh, corporate culture um, and kind of uh, corporate bureaucracy. And so in my last company, they used to measure support tickets by how quickly they were closed. And what ends up happening is there's an incentive to leave issues open, right? Because if it's a known issue, that's a very quick issue to close. And it kind of was counterintuitively incented our support team to not report issues, right? Because they didn't want them fixed. Because these issues, they knew, the, they knew the answer. They can close it right away, say known issue. And that was a quick, quick, quick close. Uh, and that would kind of average out the longer issues. Uh, so at our company, we try very, very, very hard to uh, look for patterns in problems and, and make sure to fix them. Uh, and so again, as I mentioned, we're fully open source. That gives us two separate communities. We have both a hosted and a self-host community. And the key here is that there's this beautiful relationship between the two groups. Uh, their hosted users, all they want is time. They want to save time. And they're happy to give you money if that will save them even the slightest bit of time. And self-hosts are complete opposite, right? They're techies, they're programmers. They love to debug, to figure out issues. When I get an error report from a self-host user, it's got logs, screenshots, details, where can I look, what can I do? And from the hosted users, it's like, it's broken, fix it, right? It's, you know, you're wasting my time, fix this. It shouldn't have been broken. How could you have a bug, right? This is a production app. How could you possibly allow a bug through? Uh, I also get, I also will add to this, as we keep growing, I find it harder and harder to do support. Uh, for two reasons. Uh, one is when we first started, I was so excited when I got an email. I was like, I mean, you use our app? That's amazing, right? Like, I was just shocked that anyone would even consider using it. And I felt I gave them the attention they really deserved. And as we get bigger and bigger, it's harder. It's because, you know, you get a bit jaded, I think. That you're like, well, it's, you know, I did all this work and you're going to benefit from it. 
Uh, and the other problem is I think people are getting a bit meaner to us, honestly. That I think when we're a much smaller company, people email us like human beings, talking to us like a person. And as we get bigger, what I'm finding is people email me as if, you know, I'm a support represent representative, I know nothing about the code, uh, they'll ask me questions, and I'll say, oh, speak to a manager, speak to a developer, actually know something. And it can be frustrating <laughs> when I built most of it. But, but that combination is critical. Uh, and I think what I'm struggling with myself, and it's just sharing personal growth, is kind of retaining that same mentality of when we started when each customer support request was this amazing event that I would say, we got an email. Uh, no longer the case, but again, I, I try myself to bring myself back to that, that mindset. Uh, so our, our app, we're pretty good, I think. Uh, this talk isn't about our app, really. If you want to learn more about our app, you can Google us and learn more. This is a third-party site that does um, unbiased reviews, and they gave us a perfect score, which we're really thrilled about. We're ahead of much larger companies, and I think one of the best things about this is that it's not comparing open-source companies or open-source solutions. It's comparing all solutions, all companies. And I think this is a great uh, point that, listen, you can build an open-source app at the same level as closed-source apps, and I think the key is open-source. Again, I see open-source as a force. It can be used for good or for bad. You have to kind of direct it. Uh, and one of the quick things I've had to learn as I get older is learning to say no. That's been really hard for me. So for example, early on when we got a PR, whatever it was, it was going to be merged. I was going to work with him. We had merged PRs. I was so appreciative of these changes. And that's not always the best approach. I think it's very important as you're building software like this to be able to say no. Say, listen, that PR, I really appreciated the work. Next time, maybe speak to me beforehand. But it's critical that early on I made some mistakes by merging PRs I shouldn't have merged. So that's something I really tried to, tried to improve on. So, this is not so good. <laughs> so, our last scores are for the web app, and this is for the mobile app. So what went wrong? This is something I ask myself a lot. Um, what I believe was the problem, and just to be clear, a, three, a four is eh, a three is unacceptable. I think life is too short for three-star apps, right? There's so much selection and, and choice in the store these days that I see 4.5 about as kind of a minimum threshold. Beneath that, you really are going to have a hard time convincing people to use your app. Uh, so what happened, right? How did we fail? I believe, subjectively, that our core failure was a lack of developer resources. So we are three people, but only two of us are developers, and at this point we had three code bases. And so pretty much, you know, to use a sports metaphor, we were outmanned, right? We were one man short, and we just couldn't do good enough, right? We could get the app to kind of work, but we couldn't make a great app, uh, and so really struggled. And this happened about two years ago. So you can guys imagine what happened. I'm here at this conference. Uh, around then, again, three code bases, big problem. And around then, we started looking for other solutions. And this is just when, you can see that inflection point, uh, early 2018, that's when the Flutter beta was announced. Uh, and you know, my star is there, that's when we decide as a company, this seems like a good option, let's try it. Um, and we did, uh, and it's worked out incredibly well. So we actually just started from scratch. We threw away our two native apps, and we started Clean Slate, Flutter, brand new, one code base, two apps, uh, for mobile, for iOS, and for Android. Uh, and this is the app we built. Uh, our users have loved it. You can look at it. It looks very fluttery. It's very material design. Uh, this just shows three different UI screens. Um, but our customers have really been happy with it. Uh, and so for the rest of this talk, I'd like to kind of go into detail, talk about some of the approaches we use, lessons I've learned, um, and go from here. State management, right? This is the first question everyone comes across when you come into Flutter. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail on all these options, but I just thought it might be helpful to kind of share my mindset, how I approach it. Uh, when we first started Invoice Ninja, there weren't that many options. Uh, there was really just set state. Um, RxVMS, I think, existed in Redux, and that was kind of it. And so we chose Redux because it seemed the best of the options. Uh, a big part of that choice is actually from Brian. Uh, Brian had a great video early on about the benefits of Redux. I'd never used Redux before. I'm a web developer. I'd heard about it a lot. So this is my first chance to use it. Uh, I find, and I've actually changed this talk a bit. This talk used to be a talk all about Redux, why Redux is great, how we use it. But I find in the Flutter community, Redux is just much less popular. Uh, something I think about also, uh, I mean, how many people, to show of hands, how many people are coming from mobile development? So almost everybody. And, and web developers? Well, a lot of people are web developers also. So I question whether people coming to Flutter, if they're coming from React, for example, they're very comfortable with Redux. And it just kind of makes sense. So they'll adopt that because they're coming to Flutter. Uh, but I think other developer developers come from mobile, for example, Redux is less used, maybe won't choose it. Uh, just to go quickly down the list, so you guys are all familiar with all these options. Just the way I see it, I think set state is great. I mean, if, if you can use set state and build your app, then do that, right? If it works, if it's scalable and it makes sense to you, that's the right approach for you. Uh, I think provider, everyone would agree right now, is probably one of a really good starting point for a medium complexity app. But one thing I think really important to keep in mind is provider isn't architecture. It isn't, I don't even see it necessarily state management. It's just sharing your data. It's a place to store your state and send it to your tree. 
uh, where something like Redux is kind of a full app architecture, which explains how every part of the app should function, how it all should come together. Uh, which for me personally, I, I'm not good at architecture, it's just not my strength. I like building UIs and front-end development. Uh, so using something like Redux where it's very structured, uh, really I think fit well with my, with my mindset. Uh, one point with Block I think gets lost a lot is that Block was first designed, one of the reasons was to enable sharing Dart code between Flutter and Angular Dart. Uh, that's one of the main reasons it was designed, and it's something that isn't even used. Like these days, I think most people who use Block aren't using Angular Dart. Um, I also, I myself, haven't caught up to Streams yet. It took me years to catch up to Redux. So I imagine maybe in 10 years I'll have a Streams app. Um, but I'm, I'm, you know, it just doesn't. Again, I think what Brian said makes a lot of sense to use the right tool for the job. But I think more than that, it's also the right tool for your developer mindset. We all think about code differently, and we understand it in our heads differently. We model it differently, and it's good to use a framework that kind of matches that as closely as possible. Uh, if I was going to start over today, I might use MobX. I really, really like MobX. To me, it seems to solve a lot of the problems we've seen with Redux. Um, so I would just give it strong consideration. And I think RxVMS is also a great option. And one thing nice compared to Redux is that it has eliminates all the boilerplate code. I think that's the big problem with Redux, and it's something I'll go into detail about how we try to solve it. Uh, but that has been a problem. Um, one thing I want to share is, uh, you know, I don't consider myself an expert developer. I consider myself a really at exceptionally adequate developer. Uh, but I think I have a, a secret weapon, a secret power, and that is that I love coding, right? I just enjoy it, right? You have to pull me away from my computer. I think that's what makes me, enables me to be successful. And I think with Flutter, it kind of doubles that up, right? Flutter is just fun to use. So if you code because you like it, and you start using Flutter, you'll be that much more productive. It's been, it's been my experience. Whoa, went too far there. So uh, how many people have used Redux? Are people familiar with Redux or aware of it? So most people. So I won't go into too much detail, just very quickly. Redux, what's nice about Redux is it has a very simple flow where you have your, your store, which is your state, uh, which your view is bound to. In your view, users can dispatch actions, which will use middleware to interact with your API. The reducers then update your store and then repeat, repeat, repeat. Um, and what's nice to me is that I find bugs, although they can occur, are much easier to track down because you just have to follow the pipeline, right? Follow it around, see where it's breaking, and then that's where the problem is. Uh, I also, immutability really threw me off when I first heard the term. It's like we're programmers, right? It's all about variables and changing things, and immutability just didn't make sense to me at the time. Um, but I think one way to think about immutability, immutability is that, first off, you are changing things, of course, but you're creating new objects that are different. And in terms of streams, and, and that's how Redux actually works, it's a stream controller under the hood. So what you're doing is you're seeing a stream of states. So rather than changing a piece of the state, you're just getting a whole new state. Each little chain creates an entire new state. Um, and again, just keeps repeating. So performance, this has been one of the big challenges, I think, with Redux, um, especially compared to something like Block or MobX. So with Block or MobX, just the piece that, that updated changes, whereas with Redux, if you change a small part of your store, the entire uh, UI that's bound to it will rebuild. So that sounds horrible. Uh, in practice, I found it's not always a problem because of the way Flutter works, you guys are familiar with the separate widgets and the render elements, is that even though your app is rebuilding, it's not necessarily redrawing. So although it is rebuilding, it won't necessarily make your app slow, but it's certainly not optimal. And that's something we've had to kind of uh, be conscious of. Uh, and so some ways we work around this are memoization, memoization. And the way memoization works is you pass a function parameters, and the function essentially looks at the parameters the next time and says, hey, they're the same, and then caches the value internally. So we found this really helpful in our views to memoize data, and that way when the build, as the app keeps rebuilding, it's not going to keep recalculating the data. It kind of uses the first value, and there's a great uh, Dart package that supports this. Uh, it is possible in Redux to prevent parts of the tree from rebuilding. You would use the distinct flag. Uh, in practice, I've struggled with this because use the distinct flag, you have to make sure to always override your equals equals operators, which I sometimes forget to do. And that's kind of a source of bugs. So the approach we've taken now is just not use this feature at all. Uh, and then the last point is keeping the number of layers to a minimum. Um, and this I need to confirm, because uh, I'm, I'm not certain about this, but I believe what I've seen in our app is if we have layers of routes and the, re and the Redux state changes, even layers not visible are being rebuilt, I believe, um, and which can cause performance problems, obviously. So Redux has challenges. These things I accept as problems. It has benefits also that I mentioned earlier. And I think, like all choices, it's a trade-off. Um, if you are using Redux and using immutability, I highly recommend using a package called Built Value. Uh, when I first started with Redux, I was kind of doing it all by hand, writing the copy, by, uh, copy with 
uh, immutable functions, but with built value, it'll essentially convert a class like this, log and username password, to all this code, right? This is stuff that you would have to do by hand if you weren't using built value. So this also gives you things like JSON serialization. Um, so the, the key point here is if you decide to use Redux, uh, I think you kind of have to use built value. I just don't see it uh, being manageable without it. Uh, so very quickly, this is a quick GIF, and this is kind of one of the big problems of our first app. And it's looking at persistence. So I'm in this form, I fill out a field, I quit the app, and the key now is that when you restart the app, we're right back where we were with the data in place, and there's data back, right? So this is the key point, and this is a failure we had in our last app, that we didn't have good persistence. So what happened is a user would be creating an invoice, they would start the process, switch their email app to copy and paste the customer's email address, come back, and the data was gone. Uh, and it just frustrated our, our users to no end. So this was kind of the primary goal with this new app, was to implement a great persistence implementation. Uh, and this is one area where I think Redux really works well. With Redux, you have a single store, one big, big nested object with all your data. So serialization can become, or persistence can become easy, because you just have to serialize a single object, save it to a local file, and then um, load it when you restart the app. Um, some challenges we had, and some of the solutions we had, is some of our users can have many thousands and thousands and thousands of records. So if we keep persisting the states on every change, you can have very poor performance. And so the way we solve this is we separate our persistence into multiple layers, where we have a separate for data, separate for UI, and separate for auth. And the key parts are data and UI. So data is a very large store that changes infrequently, and UI is a very small store that changes constantly. And so we broke down the app, so essentially it understands what you're doing and will persist just what needs to be persisted. And we do this using interfaces. I'll show us on the next slide a bit of sample code. Essentially, we use interfaces on our actions. And if the action implements the interface, there are middlewares that handle that. And although this is Redux specific, I think this approach could be used in, in, with other state management approaches. Uh, track loading, I do the same thing with uh, persistence. I'll show you on the next slide. And this is a key point about persistence. If you decide to use this approach to persistence, it's really important when you use track the version of your store. And that way, as you have updates, it's very possible that your changes in the app will make your last stored state invalid. So the key there is that you compare the version of your store, persistent store versus the version of the current app. If they're different, we throw away this, the persisted state and we start from scratch. So it's only through updates that the user kind of loses their stored data. Uh, and the key that what happens there, they have to essentially reload their data from the server. Um, so this is some code to show how this looks in dark code. And again, we have our top level app state. This is a massive Redux store that has everything, all the state in, in, our, in our app. Uh, and this is loading, is saving flags are changed based on those, um, based on actions. Uh, and then again, we have the separate states, the auth state, the data state, and the UI state. Uh, and this is what the code looks like. See at the top, we have these kind of generic, uh, these can, can be abstract classes, but start loading, stop loading, persist UI, and persist data. The start loading, stop loading tells the UI that will trigger, trip a flag, set to true, and they'll show a spinner in the app. And then persist UI, persist data tells the app, hey, you know, something's changed, you have to save it. And this is just an example for client actions. So see, in this case, we're sending a load client request, and this implements start loading. So automatically, this, this, the app knows, hey, I see it implements start loading, that will set the is loading to true, which the UI bound, binds to, and the spinner will appear. Uh, and then, for example, once it finishes loading, it implements stop loading and persist data. So by implementing those two classes, it'll both stop the spinner, because is loading gets set to false, and in this case, it'll also persist the data store, because the, the data itself has changed. And again, so you think about it, you know, the data store is very big, that's when you load your list of clients, where the UI, UI store is, for example, if you're creating a new record and you're typing in it, that's how we persist. We keep, on each key press, we restore the, the state using a debouncer to prevent, you know, constant saving. We essentially do like maybe a 300 second delay, and that way it's almost in real time persisted. So view models. Uh, and this goes down to, I think, separating the code, uh, separation of concerns. Uh, and the idea here is making sure your views, as, as Brian talked about, are as simple as possible. And I should also mention that all of our architecture of this code is based on Brian's sample Redux architecture. We just took his architecture and multiplied it by 1,000, right? Just took what he did and expanded it. Um, so view models allow us to separate that, where we have our view code, which just defines how the UI looks and functions, and the view model is bound to it, which we're, where we put the business logic that's related to, that, to the UI. So for, thing, for example, um, yeah, any complex UI logic with reg regards to the store. Um, we use nested view models, and I'll show you on the next slide an example, but essentially, if you have a complex screen, we'll have a top-level view model with a top-level view, and underneath that, we'll have a nested view model with nested views. And it allows us to kind of break down the complexity of the app into separate, separate widgets and separate classes, and makes it easier to manage. Um, 
when, if you deal it again, this is more Redux specific, but can be abstracted, that if you're passing data to your views, uh, with Redux, a lot of the time, it's, under the hood, it's using an inherited widget to look it up. So it's, you kind of think you would put it in init state, but you can't actually use inherited widgets in init state. So you'd want to use uh, on-change dependencies. Um, and then accessing the app state, uh, in the view using the context, so essentially there are three different ways of doing this. You can either pass it in as part of the view model, uh, access it um, in the view, uh, and then you can also separate pass each field individually. And the key point here is that we, we initially passed each field one by one, thinking this is kind of the cleanest way to do it. In practice, it just caused a lot of boilerplate, extra boilerplate code. So now we just pass the whole state to the view, and I found that to be a bit, a bit simpler. So in this example, to show you just a, a classic screen in our UI, in our app, with three separate tabs. And so what you're seeing here are actually four view models and four views. So there's one view model and one view for the, for the, the larger kind of wrapper, which is where you see the save button in the top right and the, the fab. And then each of these tabs are then their own view with their, each of their own view models. So again, so this one screen is eight separate classes. It sounds like a lot, but it provides a really nice way of breaking down your application into smaller chunks that you can work on, and then, uh, and then build it all together when you have your final commands. For example, each sub-view model is responsible for its view, then the sub-view model is you know, a factor up to the, the, the top-level view model. Memorization. Just a quick example of what this looks like. So if you have a function, uh, for example, in this case, an active client selector. Uh, and this is very simple. In this case, it's looping through the clients, finding those that are active. And to memoize it, you would just wrap it in a memoize function. You see memo2, and the 2 is simply because this function has two parameters. So when you use memoization, there's just like I think 10 different memo functions, memo1, memo2, memo3, et cetera. And this is pretty simple to implement, but has really good performance implications. Because again, this way, the, in this case, the loop through the client list only happens that one time. So forms. Uh, our app is really all built around forms. It's kind of everything in our app, and our app really, I think, is a relatively simple app compared to other apps. It's really a CRUD app, create, replace, update, delete. Um, but it all, it's all about form. This is some of the things we've learned. Uh, built value that I showed you earlier, where we had the login class and the username and the password. With built value, you can do deep nested comparison, and that's really helpful in forms. So my web background, if a user starts typing something, we would flip a flag to is change to true. But the problem with that is that way, if they undo that change, is change never goes back to false. So by using built value, you can do analysis in the form and know, is this object different than my object or the, the persisted object? Uh, avoid nullable. This is something that really hurt us early on, is that uh, when you're first creating a new object, the fields are blank. So the approach we took is to mark everything to, to allow nullable, so you can easily create objects. Uh, this caused a lot of problems, and this broke the last point. So if you start with null, and then you present that in the form, it appears changed instantly. Because what happens is when you show it to the form, the null becomes an empty string. Because in the context of the form, that's what it looks like. It's an empty string. So when it comes back, it's changed. So the key point here, particularly with Redux, but I think with other, other cases also, and built value is to avoid nullable if you can, and only use it in cases where you absolutely have to. Uh, uh, one problem with built value is, let's say you create two client records and you compare them. By default, two blank client records will evaluate to equal to true because they look exactly the same. And so the way we and that can be very difficult in the UI if you create two records and want to edit one of them. And the way we solve this is using a static negative counter, and that way every object gets a negative ID the next one available, and then when it's finally saved, we then get a positive ID back from the server. And that allows us to disambiguate between new instances of classes. Uh, and the last piece has really been the key to how our architecture kind of comes together, is completers. Uh, and this is native to Dart. And the way this works is, let's say our view has to do something. It'll dispatch an action to the, uh, the Redux, it'll go to the middleware and the reducers. We'll attach to the action a completer, and it gives us loose coupling between the views and the, and the middleware. And what happens is the action gets dispatched with the completer, and when the middleware is completed, it completes the completer. So this way, the view and the view models don't need to be aware of the middleware. They just know, hey, I requested the things to happen. And the view model can say, complete it. And the view can then update based on that immediate change. Uh, and this has been, again, really key to how we've kind of built and architected the app and has worked re really, really well for us. Uh, one point I'll mention here is for navigation, we used to attach, it felt really ugly and messy, but we'd attach the context to the actions, and we'd handle navigation in the middleware. Uh, the reason is because in the Redux world, kind of navigation is sort of like a side effect, so I thought it made sense there, and that turned out to be a big mistake. Um, the last time I gave this talk, I talked about how well it was working for us, and it, it's the kind of thing that works until it doesn't. Uh, and the problem I found with this is that it worked until 
I want to add a feature where I want to warn the user about changes. So I want to say when you change something and then navigate to a different page to say, hey, you have pending changes. Do you want to you know, dismiss your changes or keep editing? Or keep, edit keep editing? And so by, dispatch, by using the context and the state, the context changed. And then it failed, essentially. If you tried to redispatch the action the next time, context is no longer valid, failure. And it felt bad. Like sending the context and the actions never felt good, but I finally found a case where it actually broke things. So the approach we use now, I think is working a bit cleaner, is we pass the navigator, our reference to the navigator instead of the reference to the context. And it gives us really what we need at the middleware level, where we have a reference to the navigator, which regardless of UI changes, the navigator still works, right? It's a direct reference. And if you need the context, you can get the context from the navigator, which has been a useful workaround where we actually, if we pass the navigator, then need the context, for example, for localization, we can get that, again, through the navigator. Uh, so what we're seeing here is an example of this, just a short gif about how um, built value works. And what we see here is as you make a change, the icon turns blue. As you unchange it, it turns white. And this is just showing that the app is aware of what the original values were. And this works at any level of depth. So for invoices, which have invoice items, you can have nested, deep nested trees with built value. It just works automatically. You just get equals, equals, does it equal, does it not. Uh, and it's been really helpful. So just some random things that kind of picked up along the way. Um, one is never scrollable scroll physics. These are kind of some random widgets. And before this talk, I kind of tried to go through my, our code base. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, the entire app is open source. It's all on GitHub. So feel for free. I, I love it. Look at the code, review it, tell me where I'm doing things wrong, help make it better. Uh, so one of the things that I found, never scrollable scroll physics, this can be useful. We use it on grids. We want to use the grid because we like the grid element, but we don't want it to scroll. And so by default, even if it's not long enough, not too long, if you pull on it, you'll see that blue um, kind of scrolling indicator. So you can pass for the physics and never scroll the scroll physics, and something it's a way of easily disabling scrolling. Um, UI, if you want to shrink things down, you want to be uh, cognizant of the kind of the space on the screen and make small targets, you can set the material tap target size to shrink wrap. This has been really helpful for us when we have complex UIs, we want to have a lot of interactions, we can kind of just make the top target as small as possible. Uh, the widget binding instance add post frame callback. Whenever I use this, it's another example where I feel this may be a bit of an anti pattern. This allows you to do something after the build finishes. And I literally, and this is a way I, I check the problems in my code as I search for this. But it's good to be aware of, right? If you do need cases where something happens after the build, this is how you can accomplish it. But again, the cases where we use this is most likely where I've made a different mistake. And this is how I kind of recover from the other mistake, kind of layers of mistakes. Um, but it's a challenge, right? I, I mean, I'm not up here saying I'm writing the perfect code. I am trying to deploy, I'm trying to make a successful business, right? So I'm very, I try to be very pragmatic with my programming. Uh, and I try to write the best code I can, uh, but I try to revisit. And I think the key for me is that my code can't be the first draft. Right? My first draft code is usually pretty bad. And the question is, how many drafts does it take to get good code? Uh, and I'm lucky to have partners who give me that time I need to keep improving it. Uh, will pop scope. This is really helpful if you want to know if the user click back. And we're using this currently. Um, I'll show you this a bit later. I'll explain a bit later how we use this to solve a current problem. And ignore pointer. This enables you to kind of cancel any clicks in the UI. And we use this a lot in our forms. Because what we'll do is we'll want, for example, like a date picker. We'll want to show a date picker in a form, but a date picker doesn't really have a UI element. So what we do is we take text fields, we wrap them in both a, uh, a gesture detector, or I think an inkwell, and then wrap that, and then essentially, so it's text field, ignore pointer, and then a gesture detector. And that gives us a way where from the UI perspective, it looks like a text field, you click on it, you don't get the text field, you get something else. And then, for example, in that case, we'll show a date picker. And then once we get the value back from the date picker, we'll use a text field controller to set the value on the text field. And we can use all kinds of UI elements that don't have their own UI necessarily, and it's a way of kind of binding them into your forms. Uh, this is one problem that I had early on. I just had to share this. That you see that yellow border around the, the app. I always thought this was an error. I always thought like I got, there's some error. This is telling me there's an error because I'm used to in Flutter. You know, there's the um, the red background with the failures and the yellow and black police tape. So I thought this was another form of it. It turns out it's not an error. This is a focusing issue. Uh, and these slides are all available. It's if it, you go to itsallwidgets.com/slides, you can get these slides. But this little line of code has been really helpful. You just add it and it just fixes this problem. So I kind of just want to throw this in here. Code generator. So Redux. Uh, I talk about how Flutter makes me happy, and coding makes me happy, and Redux sometimes makes me happy, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, I literally, each day, I don't know if I like Redux. I'm really on the fence. It's, again, it's my first time using Redux. I, I will say one thing. I, you know, 
I get, like a lot of us, to question the quality of my code. Uh, and I have found with Redux, I feel more like an engineer than I've ever felt before. Like in the past, I always felt like I was throwing code in a wall and see what worked. Whereas with Redux, I feel like I've engineered an app. I understand it, I can follow it, uh, and I like that about it. However, you end up with a ton, a ton, a ton of boilerplate code. I mean, it's really, it's kind of, it's concerning in some ways. Uh, and I think Brian has a great example where he did one app in, three, in a few different state management examples, and I think Redux was about 50% more code than Block. So if you're talking about a large app, 100,000 lines of code, that's an extra 50,000 lines of code. That's serious. And so we saw early on this was going to be a problem, and so we created a code generator. This is also open source, and what it enables you to do, it's kind of like mail merge. You can create your first module, and the, the package comes with the first Redux module. You can then kind of copy and paste it to other modules, and it'll merge in the specific name. So we create these stub classes. Uh, it then, again, merges in your specific name, and then generates all this boilerplate code for you. Um, again, this solves the problem, because it auto-generates the code. The problems we have found is it's critical you get it right at the beginning. What ends up happening is, and I saw this firsthand, is I made small mistakes early on, and those mistakes get multiplied. Because as each time you're on the code generator, you're getting another whole chunk of code that has the same mistake. So code generators can be good if you have you know, good code, but if you're generating bad code, you've always got a problem. And I think also the key here, and the mistake I made, was I needed to abstract as much as possible. I think the code generator, for code generators to be successful, they have to just be generating the glue, like those little bits that are necessary, and nothing unnecessary. So what I should have done more of, and I've done some of, is abstracting the data or the, the UI as much as possible to, to kind of sub-widgets, and the generator would just then generate these specific custom widgets that are needed to glue things together. Um, again, this is a good example of how you could use this package. So for example, if you have a JSON data source and you want to convert it into an application, this package with about three lines of code will create an app that takes that JSON and gives you a working app that can interact. You can view the list, edit items, add items, etc. cetera. Um, I think if I was going to do this again, I like the concept of this generator construct. I, I think Redux isn't so popular in the Flutter world. It might make sense to take this approach and use maybe a different management, state management option. Um, but again, it's, it's all available. It's on GitHub. Um, again, if you're considering using Redux for your app, it's certainly worth considering. Um, uh, two caveats. Well, one is, again, Redux may not be the right choice for you. Maybe it is. Uh, I also, I, we built this code generator at the very beginning of our app development. And my plan, and when I get the time, is I'd like to come back now that I've had a lot more experience and try to take the best code we have now from Invoice Ninja or Invoicing.co and bring it back into the generator. Uh, but again, if you have use for it, please use it and please give me any feedback. So just a few best practices that, you know, a lot of you guys may know this already. This is some things I've learned through our project. Is one in particular is the analysis options YAML file. When you create a new Flutter project, you get a very loose linting um, file. Uh, and I think it's critical, especially if you're new to Dart, that it's good to get the, the analysis YAML file from, analysis options file from the Flutter project. They have much stricter rules. And there are many other, other projects, those like pedantic you can use to do stricter linting. But I find it's critical as you're learning Dart, because this helps kind of guide you and hold your hand and make sure you, you know, make the right choices. Uh, this is a common conversation in the Reddit threads, is custom widgets versus functions. I think everyone knows custom widgets are a little bit f more performant. I don't actually see that as a reason to use custom widgets. What I find is it just makes it cleaner to, um, to understand the code and to subdivide it. It also makes it more reusable. So what I found is our development keeps accelerating. So as we were building our app, I keep building more and more custom widgets just for our domain. And as I, the next day, I can then start reusing and leveraging. And I found the first module took the most time, but each additional module, I'm faster and faster, because what I am developing is a custom Flutter framework for my app, right? Each widget I build is what I need to fill myself my use cases. And even if there's tiny, tiny widgets, for for example, like a text next to an icon or an icon next to a text. I'll just create an icon text widget. And I find these little widgets help you kind of shrink that nested tree that can sometimes get a bit too deep. Um, this is a cool trick, Flutter Dart Format Lib. This is really useful. It'll just at once format your entire code base, uh, which I find really helpful every once in a while. You know, most people have it set up so that their IDE will autosave, but every once in a while you can do this in this way. It prevents your git commits from being kind of muddied by unrelated changes. Um, my background is web development, where we automatically have server-side logging. Uh, and when we first deployed our Flutter app, I was like, wow, no bugs, no one's complaining. All right? But what happened was, in truth, is that Flutter is so good that when it fails, our users don't notice, right? Or if they notice, they don't care enough to complain, right? If they use an app and it crashes when something goes wrong, they are going to tell you about it. They're going to tell you over and over again, hey, your app crashes. But if they're using the app and a small bit turns red with a bit of yellow or something's maybe a bit cut off, 
they won't necessarily report it. So I have found it's critical for us to have a back-end solution. Oh, we use Sentry.io ourselves, which is great. It's also open source. You can run it yourself, host it on your own servers. Uh, but right when that went live, we instantly found a whole slew of bugs we weren't even aware of just because Flutter did such a good job of hiding it. And then, as I mentioned earlier, if you are going to use immutability, I really recommend built value. Uh, I started off not using it and was just doing everything by hand, uh, and it was a lot of extra unnecessary code. Uh, so this slide's probably hard to read, but what, what this is showing is if you're curious about Flutter and really want to dive deep into it and see what's happening in the future, if you add flutter.dev slash any of these lines, so go templates or go, it will be a short link directly to the Google Doc that the Flutter team used to discuss the feature and stuff in progress. This was hidden somewhere in the GitHub source for the Flutter site. Uh, again, it's in the slides, but I really recommend if you're serious about Flutter and you want to understand where it's going, this is where you can see it. It's all in the open. I was at a talk yesterday where they were talking about Flutter 2.0, and maybe there'd be massive breaking changes, like Swift, for example. And my take is, it's not what they want, right? They want breaking changes when necessary, but they really are trying to minimize it, because they appreciate how much code has been written, and they're certainly not looking to break it all. So again, if, you know, one thing to take away from this slide, if this talk, is I cannot recommend enough. Each one of these is a goldmine of really interesting Flutter information, and I highly recommend reading these docs and also providing feedback if you have input. So at this point, our app is live. We went from three code bases down to two code bases, and we are very happy. Uh, to show you again, our scores were not good. We were not happy with this. Even a four to me wasn't good enough, but a three was absurd and actually somewhat embarrassing, to be honest. And I'm only showing this because this is our, our old app, and this was built with native technologies. And then we then deprecated it, released our new app, and da -da, much better. So again, this to me shows that it's not about technology. It's about, I, I believe, what's critical, what really changed here is the developer resources, right? We went from two code bases to one code base for a single developer, and you just have more time. That's it, right? You have more time, especially if you need, like me, you needed time to do multiple drafts of your code. You have that time now, right? Because you're writing half the code. Um, and so this is, again, why we're all here fundamentally, right? It's, it's this idea of sharing code between platforms. So the dream, though, one code base. Is that possible? Can we do it? So uh, our back end will always have a separate code base, right? We, need a, we don't use Firebase. We use, have our own custom Laravel PHP back end. And that's really critical for us, for our open source community. They would be very upset, disappointed if we use Firebase, because that would incur cost to them to run our software. So by building a custom back end, it's free to run, free to host themselves. But can we achieve one code base? And this is what we've been after. So I've spent the past six months uh, working on Flutter Web. And so what we've done is we've taken, if you remember the screen before, our mobile app, and we are in the process of converting it to a web app. Uh, and in the future, I think this is the hard part. Once we get this, we believe the desktop app will be much simpler. And so with this, this is enabling us to again have a single code base across not just you know, mobile, not just Android iOS, but Android iOS, desktop, you know, Mac OS. You know this drill, right? This is Flutter. It's amazing. And from our perspective, we believe this will be a massive competitive advantage, bless you, against the other competitors, right? We know our large competitors, they may have more developers, they may have more money, <laughs> they may have more lots of things, but what we have is less, less code, right? And that to me is just going to be an incredible strategic advantage. And I'll say, so what we're working on is available now. Now, to be very clear, this is, a, this is not even alpha, this is pre alpha. This is like, uh, <laughs> I'm like, Fixing, there are tons of open bugs, but I'm sharing this because I think it might be useful so you guys can see what I'm working on, what our company is working on. Uh, the progress we've had so far has been amazing. It reminds me of a lot of the early days of Flutter, right? If you're doing Flutter Web, serious Flutter Web now, you kind of have to be on at least dev, if not master, which feels like the old days of Flutter, where you couldn't be unstable, it just wasn't up to date enough. Um, but again, this has been a really interesting process. Um, uh, to share a couple, of, a couple of challenges we're having, the big one obviously is plugins. It's kind of a known thing. We're waiting on plugins. What's nice is as new plugins become available, our app just gets better, right? Each new plugin. So last week, we implemented the uh, um, shared preferences. So now our web app has complete persistence. So I showed you the persistence on the mobile app. As you start typing change, quit the app, come back, it's there. Now our web app has that same feature, which our, our initial web app doesn't even have, right? The initial web app, if your browser crashes, you lose your unsaved data. With Flutter, we've been able to build essentially a really powerful single page S application, SPA, with much better features than our older app has. Again, through dark, strict typing, and just again, a better, better framework. Just to end the talk, uh, if you guys don't know my background, I, I was one of the people along with Thomas Burkhardt, uh, Simon Lightfoot, and Scott Stoll. The four of us worked together to create itsawidgets.com. If you guys build apps, please submit them. 
Um, I want to credit Thomas for the great name. It was actually going to be a podcast initially, uh, but it turned out it's going to be another podcast that Thomas had the idea for It's All Widgets. Uh, and so again, hopefully you find it useful. The one thing I would suggest with this site is flip the open source switch, and then you have a great listing of over 200 incredible open source apps, and I myself use it as a resource for learning. Uh, so I, again, if you're making apps, please consider submitting them. And then just lastly, um, invoicing can be a bit boring sometimes, so I have a side project I wanted to share quickly. It's an app called Mudeo. It stands for Music Video. So if anybody, this is also completely open source. Uh, if anyone is a musician here, this idea is just that if you, it's like GitHub for music. So one person can start a song and someone else can fork it and change it and then add layers to it and change the song, things like that. Uh, it's doing okay. It's hard. Apps like this are hard. It's hard to get attention. I, I think one thing I'm really hopeful for is to port this to Flutter Web. It's hard. I can't even get my friends sometimes to say, download the app. They just won't download it, right? There's friction there. But I'm pretty sure if I have a link, I believe we're going to have a much easier way of sharing this application. If it's just, hey, you go to mudio.app and you see the app, we think that it'll you know, potentially give us a better chance at improving the app and getting more users. So if anybody here is a musician, please feel free to try the app. Jam with me virtually. Uh, and that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, so, are there, I think we have five minutes. Are there any questions? Quick question. Quick question. You talked about the persistent store, and um, did you ever run into a case where you had an invalid state and the user was always forced to go to a, uh, to a particular screen and could not escape? How is the user able to invalidate the state? In the right, that's a good store? question. So we've definitely had issues like that. Uh, one way to invalidate this, the simplest way is just to reinstall the app, which, right, that, that does yeah. it. Bit of a workaround, not so good. We also, it, when we uh, hydrate the state, we also make sure to check for errors. If we catch any errors, then we throw it away in that case. Um, those are the two options. In our web interface, we're going to have actually a way of overriding the state. But right now, we don't have a way of manually overriding the state in the app, and maybe you should consider. That's a good suggestion. Cool. Any other questions? Cool. All right, thank you very much again.